with the land acknowledgments. We would like to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Denina people. The land that Anchorage is situated on is the traditional sovereign and unceded land of the Denina. We honor the, with gratitude the land itself and the Denina people past, present, and future. We would also love to thank our community partners. You cannot put on a program like this without a lot of help from a lot of people. Tonight we're working with Move to Amend, Alaska Common Grounds, and American Promise. And with that, I would like to introduce our moderator, Bill Hall from Alaska Common Ground. Thank you. Good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, we're we're going to be uh, tackling this subject because the whole issue of our constitutional rights is is sort of before us now in this uh, electoral uh, season. And there are many people who are concerned about maybe we're going to have a constitutional crisis as a result of the election. They're worried about uh, their personal rights under the Constitution and how they're being affected uh, in the last few years. So uh, we were fortunate that we can talk about what we can do about it. And we have Beverly Churchill, uh, who is available to, uh, to give us, uh, share with us what she's learned uh, in her work with Move to Amend. And I understand, Beverly, you may be assisted by Kevin a little bit sometimes uh, on answering questions. Yes, hopefully Kevin okay. is, is okay. in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what we're going to try to do is, uh, is have you submit your questions uh, using the chat function uh, of Zoom. Uh, and I will I will try to, uh, I will monitor the chat, Zoom group chat, and I will pick your questions out and then I will ask them, I will read them for the benefit of, of Beverly and Kevin so that they can respond and, and, and hopefully answer your question effectively. Uh, if you don't get it quite clear and you want a clarification, you can use the chat function for that too. Uh, later, uh, after we've answered hopefully most of the questions, it may be possible for us to, to actually allow some participants to ask their questions by unmuting their microphone. We'll see how that works if we need to. Uh, but for now, uh, I, think, uh, I think we're ready for, uh, for, for Beverly to begin her presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Bill and Stacia for your introductions. Um, I'd like to just review what we're hoping to accomplish tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we're hoping to cover three objectives. The first is to just go over the nuts and bolts of how to amend the Constitution. The second uh, section will be looking at two recent amendment attempts and what we might learn from them. And then the third component will be looking at a current pending amendment action. Next. On September 17th, 1787, the US Constitution was signed into the law of the land. Now we honor that moment on every September 17th by studying this document. As we have uh, mentioned, we're tonight obviously gonna be studying and focusing on amending that Constitution. And as Bill mentioned, we welcome you to a discussion later of the essential components of this um, effort. Next. I am the president of a local affiliate of a national organization known as Move to Amend. I often get the question, move to amend what? My response is amend the US Constitution, of course. The reaction is likely a wry smile, lifting of eyebrows, and a remark like, well, good luck with that. But as we talk, most folks agree that there are definitely some improvements that could be made to this foundation of our laws and our nation. Next. So they want to know, how do we do that again? Something about the states having to pass it or some kind of convention. 
Well, we believe that the founding fathers understood that it may need to be changed from time to time. In fact, President Jefferson is quoted as recommending that the document be considered every generation or so. So yes, they provided ways to make changes in Article 5 of the Constitution. All four methods require passage by two-thirds vote, either through the state legislatures, Congress, or by convention, and then ratification by three quarters of the states. So while they did see the need, they did not make it easy. And with the addition of 37 states, it can indeed be an uphill battle. So is it worth attempting? Next. So I just want to reiterate again with this really nice chart, thanks to McGraw-Hill Education, um, that there are several routes that can be taken. The first method, which uh, goes through Congress, is the one that is most often used. In this method, the amendment is proposed by Congress by two thirds of votes in both houses, then ratified by three fourths of the state's legislatures. The second method is where the amendment is proposed by Congress by two thirds vote in both houses but then ratified by special conventions in three-fourths of the states. Only the repeal of Prohibition, 21st Amendment, was adopted in this fashion. The third method is where the amendment is proposed at a constitutional convention, then ratified by three-quarters of the state legislatures. And lastly, an amendment is proposed at a national convention called by Congress when requested by two thirds of the state legislatures and then ratified by special conventions held in three fourths of the states. So when we're talking two thirds, we're talking about 34 states and when we're talking about three quarters, we're talking about 38 states. Next. So let's uh, move into looking at a couple of examples of uh, amendments or attempts to amend the Constitution. The first one being the 26th Amendment. This amendment changed the voting age from 21 to age 18. A long debate that lasted some 30 years started during World War II as young men were being conscripted into armed forces at a massive rate starting at age 18. In other words, there were many families who were called to send their young sons off to war. There was a grassroots effort and the slogan, old enough to fight, old enough to vote, became the war cry for this movement. Next. Support for the change came forward in Congress in 1941 with legislation introduced in 1942, but no action was taken. Meanwhile, the effort took hold at the local level, and in 1943, the state of Georgia lowered its voting age uh, in its state and local elections, followed by Kentucky in 1955. Eisenhower vo voiced support for the change in his 1954 State of the Union address. Despite continued support, it wasn't until the tumultuous times of the Vietnam War that the nation was pushed to action. Next. Vietnam War was controversial and none were more opposed than the youth of the nation. Demonstrations swelled with opposition to the draft and many youth felt they were being forced to fight an immoral and unjust war. Sentiment from past efforts came to life and created a groundswell that moved Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And next. Although Nixon signed the Voting Act into law, he voiced the opinion that it was not constitutional. And indeed, it was contested in courts until in 1970, the US Supreme Court considered the case Oregon versus Mitchell. The court was divided, but the ultimate decision struck a portion of the law down on the basis that Congress does not have the power to change laws in state and local elections, although it does for federal elections. 
With increased grassroots demand, it only took two months for Congress to approve the change as an amendment to the Constitution. Next. So here we have a slide showing uh, the official language of the 26th Amendment. And uh, then we want to ask ourselves, why was this a success? Uh, as we reviewed, first of all, it had strong grassroots support, um, starting with World War II, that was uh, strengthened by the anti-war youth movement stirred by the Vietnam War in the 1960s. Secondly, there was action taken in Congress to address it. And thirdly, no strong counter movement arose to block it. Next. In contrast, let us take a look at another major effort to amend the Constitution, spearheaded by the leaders of the women's movement of the 1960s. Despite a groundswell of support that carried the Equal Rights Amendment to near completion, opposition sprung up and garnered the support of more conservative elements of the American society, insisting that the amendment would be bad for women and bad for America. The current Hulu miniseries, Mrs. America, gives an excellent and entertaining portrayal of these events. Next. The uh, 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, giving women the right to vote. Yet, many realized there was still vast systemic discrimination against women, and they pressed for an Equal Rights Amendment. However, the grassroots groundswell was not there, and the movement died. Still, the issue remained for millions of American women, and with the rise of the women's movement in the 60s, the idea was revived next. The ERA, as it became known, garnered increased support through the end of the 1960s. It was approved by the U.S. House of Representatives in 1971 and then by the U.S. Senate in 1972. It was then submitted to the state legislatures for ratification using method one as we have reviewed. On the map, on the slide, uh, the blue states signify those states that ratified the amendment, including Alaska. The turquoise states ratified it, but later rescinded. And the yellow states only ratified it in one house, so it was never passed. And finally, the pink states did not ratify. Uh, I added the uh, picture above to uh, try to portray the involvement of Congress in this action, but on closer look, I realized that it was Jimmy Carter with Rosalind Carter in the background, along with some other people. And he was governor of Georgia and Georgia did not ratify the uh, amendment. So I'm not sure why this picture got in here, but I do have an interesting note about it. Jimmy Carter was a supporter of the ERA. Rosalind, however, was not. And she was very vocal about her concern about her husband's support. However, as time went on, Rosalind became a very big supporter of the ERA. However, a struggle ensued, deadlines were set and reset, five states revoked their votes and it came up short. It was Phyllis Schlafly who started the Stop ERA movement. One of the big arguments was the fear of women being drafted to go to war. So here we have these two examples of recent attempts, well, fairly recent, to amend the Constitution, one successful and one that fell short. The ERA had, a long, had long standing support, but it suffered from opposition at the end. What lessons may be found in this comparison? This is up for discussion which we hope you will participate in at the end of the presentation. And I wanna just remind you that you can put your comments and questions in the chat box as we go. Next. So today, various amendments to the Constitution are being considered. Uh, national balanced budget, 
uh, term limits for Congress and ending dark money in politics are just some of the more popular ones. In fact, there are some 200 amendments being introduced every year. Many are flash in the pan issues with less staying power. For example, in 1938, a dueling ban amendment was proposed so that anyone killing someone in a duel could not hold federal office. In 1893, an amendment was proposed to change the name of the country to the United States of Earth and to abolish the Army and Navy. Less obscure was the Blair Amendment, proposed in 1875, abolishing religious institutions from using public funds for religious purposes. While it failed, many states adopted similar, similar provisions. And while the ERA was not passed, it is credited with the momentum that pushed passage of Title IX, which amended the Higher Education Act in 1972 and states, no person in the U.S. shall, based on sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Next slide. Let's take a closer look at one current movement to amend the Constitution in response to the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. This decision was issued by the Supreme Court on January 20th, 2010, just a little over 10 years ago. It sent shockwaves through American politics. Citizens United Inc., a nonprofit education group, was unhappy with being barred from showing a film critical of Hillary Clinton prior to the Democratic primary because it was too close to the date of the primary, according to the McCain-Feingold Campaign Finance Act. The later 20th century and up to present has seen a growing use of corporations, including nonprofits, unions, and associations that have sought to influence politics. They range from the Sierra Club to the National Rifle Association, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the AARP. IRS rules dictate what they can and cannot do and still maintain their special tax status. Since this ruling of um, the Supreme Court, profit corporations, including those with foreign ownership, are now able to contribute and are doing so primarily through trade associations, as well as political action committees, where there is no reporting requirement. Um, these are also called dark money, and uh, we will be talking about that uh, in our educational um, presentation next month. Next. So the ruling is based on a judicial precedence that corporations are persons and that money is equal to free speech. So I just want to take um, a minute or two to look at these two issues and the proposed solutions by amendments. Next. Okay, so a person, as portrayed on the left, has constitutional rights. Persons own corporations, and as persons, they have their own constitutional rights. Do they have another layer of constitutional rights through ownership of a corporation or membership in a union or association? Corporations gain constitutional rights through court actions. The most notable one was in the case of Santa Clara County versus the Southern Pacific Railroad in 1886. Railroads were the most powerful entities at the time and even judges sitting on the Supreme Court had worked for them in that decision, a headnote was placed by a court clerk stating, and as we all know, corporations are persons. And it has been used as legal precedent going forward. Next. A timeline of these court decisions regarding the rights of persons and corporations can be found at the above link. It will also be found in the chat box for your use. The timeline was originally the work of Jan Edwards of the organization Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in 2000. She spearheaded the first successful effort to pass a resolution to end corporate personhood 
in her community. Okay, next. Okay, so the next slide is we are going to study um, the issue of money as free speech. Money in politics has been a bipartisan issue for many years. Congress passed the Federal Election Com Campaign Act in 1971 that mandated reporting requirements of contributions and expenditures and formed the Federal Election Commission. In 1975, a group of plaintiffs sued the government, represented by Secretary of State Vallejo. The primary plaintiff was Senator Buckley, but there was a mix of interests that joined the suit, including the Peace and Freedom Party, the New York Civil Liberties Union, and the Libertarian Party, among others. As a result of this case, some of the provisions of the act were struck down in 1976 by the Supreme Courts and including limits on expenditures by campaigns and the powers of the Federal Election Commission were limited. The ruling did upload, excuse me, uphold limits on contributions and disclosure provisions. But most importantly, it made clear that money is freedom of speech. This case is known as Buckley versus Vallejo. Okay, next. The next slide, uh, we have the results of a um, survey that was taken by the Pew Research Center in January of 2012, two years after the Citizens United decision. It shows the majority of voters, regardless of political affiliation, believe the ruling in Citizens United has a negative effect on campaigns. A poll recently on May, in May 2018, conducted by the University of Maryland's School of Public Policy also saw overwhelming bipartisan support for measures to end the undue influence of money in politics. Okay, next slide. In this slide, we show the 20 states that have now called for an amendment to the Constitution to address the issue of corporate personhood and runaway money in politics. Some were passed by the state legislatures and some by ballot initiatives. This map is complements of public citizen. The numbers in the green circles are the number of cities that have passed resolutions in each state. The numbers in the red squares are US senators for each state that have co-sponsored bills. And in the purple squares are the numbers of the US representatives co-sponsoring bills as well. The green, the states colored in green have actually passed resolutions. Uh, and below the map is listed in alphabetical order those states. In addition, over 700 municipalities have called for a, a constitutional amendment. Okay, next slide. All right, many organizations have formed also to fight for change. Uh, these are the ones that I'm familiar with, and I'm sure there are more. American Promise, Take Back Our Republic, and Citizens United, Citizens Take Action, Move to Amend, Common Cause, People for the American Way, Public Citizen, Wolf Pack, and Equal Citizens. I just want to look at four of them briefly here because these four have had a presence in Alaska. The first one is the Wolf Pack. Their focus is on the corrupt influence of money and their primary solution is to push for an Article 5 convention. They note that some amendments that they, uh, some amendments have had successful um, push for a convention. And although they never held the convention, it pressed Congress to action. The second one is move to amend. Their focus is on the issue of corporate personhood. And they believe that the right of free speech is meant only for natural persons along with all other constitutional rights. They want to see the concept of money as free speech addressed as well. Third, we have American Promise, building national cross-partisan consensus and a specific effective language for the 28th Amendment are their focus. 
And finally, equal citizens. Their focus is on court battles. A recent one was in Alaska, and we will discuss that in a moment. Okay, next slide. All these groups are pushing Congress to take action. Yet today, not one bill has been brought to the floor for discussion on the issue. Instead, Congress members are spending 20 to 30 hours a week fundraising to keep up with the pace. And when they're winning, they're less interested in regulating. So on the slide, we have four examples of some of the legislation that is um, being introduced in Congress right now. And there is a link to um, a place on the uh, amend, Move to Amend website that has a further analysis and comparison of these particular um, bills. And again, you should be able to find that link in the chat box that you can utilize. Okay, next slide. Okay, as we discuss those first two amendment or issues earlier, we noted that the opposition was a factor. So let's look at the opposition to amending the Constitution uh, on this issue. Uh, in 2014, the Supreme Court ruled in McCutcheon versus the Federal Election Commission. The co-appellant was the Republican National Committee, and the court ruled that aggregate limits are unconstitutional, that is, for individuals. So this ruling further expanded um, the, uh, what do you say, the lack of campaign finance laws um, to individuals. Also, in the state of Alaska, the case Thomas versus Hebden the state's campaign finance laws was upheld by the Alaska District Court, but appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court, where a portion of the law was struck down regarding contributions from outside the state. Next slide. After the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United, Alaska Public Offices Commission, or APOC, stopped enforcing Alaska's limits on independent expenditures. The 2018 election cycle showed an unprecedented level of outside and super PAC money in Alaska campaigns. APOC data shows independent expenditures increased 360% and nearly two thirds of this independent expenditure money was from outside. APOC was sued and the state superior court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs who were represented by equal citizens. It ruled that APOC was out of line in refusing to enforce the Alaska campaign finance laws as they stood at the time. Next slide. So in conclusion, we have covered the ways in which an amendment can be made to the constitution. We have reviewed examples of two recent amendment movements. The first one being the 26th Amendment that changed the voting age from 21 to 18 and the failed attempt to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. In the end, what we have learned that in order for an amendment to be passed, it needs to have a strong grassroots movement. It needs the political will in Congress and it needs a lack of strong opposition. Lastly, we have also learned that it may take more than one generation for an idea to come to fruition. And in the meantime, efforts may spark changes in the local level, as well as changes in other areas of national law. Okay, last slide. Thank you for your attention. Um, I think that we are going to move to our discussion um, and comments. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bill Hall. Thanks, Beverly. So we're entertaining uh, questions. Uh, please write them on chat. Uh, if you find that too difficult, I suppose we can, if you want to raise your hand, we could handle it that way too. 
So anybody have a question they want to pose to Beverly? Wow, I guess I answered everybody's questions. Well, I'll ask one. Why, why is this uh, move to amend important to us? Why is move to amend important to us? Well, um, the fact is, is that it has opened the floodgates of money into our, um, our campaigns, our political campaigns. And as individuals, we, you know, the average American cannot keep up, number one, with that amount of money that is flooding in exponentially every campaign cycle. Number two, our elected officials are spending 20 to 30 hours a week just in fundraising. Um, so it's getting to be where the focus is getting more about raising money than about governance. Thirdly, the fact that uh, corporations can have the same rights as persons means that um, they definitely are way bigger, they have way more power than the average person, and so it creates an uneven and unequal playing field um, in, in courts, um, in, in law. And so this is creating disenfranchisement by the people in the political process. And Kevin, do you have anything else to add? Um, <clears throat> well, there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of more theoretical reasons why uh, many people object to the Citizens United decision. Uh, you can go to sort of the philosophical concept that uh, you know, we are endowed by our creator with, with inalienable rights, you know, from the Declaration of Independence. And uh, corporations, of course, are not created by our creator, they're created by human beings. And so uh, that's sort of a philosophical objection to uh, constitutional rights for corporations. Um, but the, the big flood of money into campaigns and the uh, fact that individual citizens are increasingly unable to be heard over the hurricane of uh, money, including dark money in political elections, is a source of frustration for ordinary voters that is prompting many of them to be involved. Thank you. We have a question from Sharman. It's, what is happening in Alaska now? Well, we're seeing again a flood of money. Um, now we have two initiatives on the ballot. Our finance, our campaign finance laws are not addressing initiatives, but um, one thing is the initiatives do have to declare where, um, what their top three um, donors are. And we're seeing, uh, you know, money coming in from the outside, of course. And, um, I'm not sure about what is happening with our campaign finance laws, uh, if that case is being appealed further. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Kevin, do you have any idea on the status of that case? No, I, I don't know the current status. But what we do know is that our campaign finance laws, which are some of the most stringent in the country have been held up as a, a model for the country and that they have been under assault. Well, we're open for more questions. I'm sure you guys must have some idea of uh, what you'd like to talk about or have Beverly talk about. If you don't want to write it in the chat box, you can raise your hand. Frank, you're on, there you go. Okay, I'm gonna unmute so that you can hear me. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Pebble Project and how that is affected, how that the will of the people is uh, ran over by big money and influence. Well, I'm gonna defer to Kevin on that one because uh, 
he's a little more familiar with it. Sure. Well, the, the, there's been quite a number of different uh, legal challenges uh, brought to the Pebble Mine. Uh, one effort that was made was uh, the passage of an initiative by the citizens of the Lake and Peninsula Borough, which is the borough in Alaska where the Pebble Mine would be located. And uh, they passed an initiative that would require a local permit from uh, the local borough government for any mines over a certain size. And obviously Pebble Mine is one of the largest uh, uh, mining proposals in the state of Alaska and it clearly would have been uh, subject to the requirement for a local permit at the state and local level, at the, at the borough level, uh, if this initiative had been passed. It was in fact passed by the voters of the, of the borough and then was challenged in court on numerous grounds, including constitutional grounds. And this raises the whole concept of uh, whether corporations should have constitutional rights and be able to assert constitutional rights to override the majority democracy decision of, of uh, actual human beings who voted in that election. Um, eventually that initiative uh, was struck down by the courts uh, using a variety of different legal theories. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether it was a constitutional argument or more of a statutory interpretation argument uh, that was finally prevailing in that case, but um, it's also an example that when you have such very powerful economic players even threatening to file a lawsuit based upon constitutional rights, it can have a uh, deterrent effect and can uh, uh, discourage uh, local governments from exercising uh, health and safety measures that they might otherwise wish to take uh, to protect their citizens. We have a question from Stacia. It says, I just watched a TEDx talk that pointed out the racism embedded in the U.S. Constitution, referring to Native Americans as savages, counting African Americans as three-fifths of a person, not referring to women at all, what would you think of a complete rewriting of the Constitution to ensure that equality is embedded in the foundation of our country? Wow, Stacia, nothing small there. <laughs> um, actually, there is a movement afoot, uh, and Move to Amend is, is a part of it, uh, where there is, there's people convening to consider that very thing, um, the people's constitution and they are um, coming together to rewrite the constitution in the form that they believe for today it would be most beneficial to the most people and to our nation so that's definitely an issue in a lot of people's minds and there are people working on that um, consideration also i think it's really uh interesting um point that when the Constitution was written, indeed, people were property, you know, slaves were property. Um, and today, we've, we've gotten rid of that. But now we have it flipped where property has the rights of persons. So where are we going with that? <laughs> okay, we have a question from Catherine. Do you have any recommendations for readings, talks, or videos that discuss more of the past movements mentioned? Hmm. Well, um, for sure that uh, special, Hulu special, um, Mrs. America is an excellent, excellent um, portrayal of the Equal Rights Amendment. And to be honest, I can't think right off the top of my head of other good books, but I think that the library is going to have a resource list, if I am correct, that they plan to provide. So you might check that out. It's not about history. Yeah. Was that clear for you, Catherine? Well, yeah, Frank is showing um, there's several books that have been written 
uh, about this issue. Um, Frank is holding one up called Unequal Protection. And there's also one that's written called People Are Not Corporations. Um, so there are several books written specifically about um, the person's, uh, the personhood of corporations and um, money as free speech. But I was thinking more in terms of the past amendments and that kind of history. So I wasn't sure what, what you were referring to. Okay, we've got a, a response to that from Stacia. I don't know if everybody's reading the chat, but uh, uh, Stacia says that uh, she sent a basic list of, uh, of library materials and she can create a more specialized list about past amendments and campaign finance. So the library is a good place to go. And I see Sharman has a question. Or uh, something to add to this conversation. Adam Winkler wrote a terrific book about the history of the evolution of uh, corporate constitutional law through the, um, the court cases. And um, Kevin, do you remember the name of the Winkler book? He's a wonderful writer. He's a, uh, a law professor at UCLA and he writes all the human interest gory backstory for all these episodes in the history of the evolution of the law. So it's actually a highly readable book. While Kevin's looking for that, uh, has anybody else got a, another question? Frank. What would you suggest we do locally besides just get out the vote? I think that's big. Oh, there's the Kevin is holding it up. We the corporations. Okay. What else can we do locally? We can ask uh, the people that are running for office. We can ask them their position on uh, on this uh, issue. Um, we can hold them accountable. Congress is not taking action. Um, there's a lot of gridlock. And so they need the people to hold them accountable. Um, people can also, there's a lot, a lot of organizations out there. And so all of them are working and working towards this effort. So getting involved with one of the organizations is something that people can do as well. So Kari has posted quite a list on chat. I hope all of you can see that. And uh, I guess that's just the beginning, but that looks like a pretty comprehensive list. So any question from people who haven't spoken yet or written anything yet that you'd like to have answered about the constitution, amending it? So we have uh, Sharman says ballot measure two supports a constitutional amendment. That's the Alaska constitution, I think. Is that right, Sharman? No, it's the US constitution. Oh, the, there's a ballot measure two on the US constitution, okay. Ballot measure two talks about ranked choice voting, uh, top four open primary, uh, more disclosure to uh, of of dark money in Alaska elections, and in the preamble, it also supports a U.S. constitutional amendment um, to restore our rights to write our own campaign finance laws and enforce our Alaska law. Good, and I think uh, if you look on the chat, uh, Kari has provided some information that Alaska Common Ground is hosting events on each of the ballot measures, and you can find out more about them at uh, alaskacommonground.org events slash events uh, dash three backslash.
Well, we have a lot of you on here. I, I'm wondering why did you decide you wanted to attend this presentation? Can anybody sort of tell us why did you want to attend this? What did you expect to get out of it? Well, Frank gave us one. <laughs> Meet other people that love democracy. Well, Robert has one. Uh, says, I think this is one thing most people can agree on. We need unifying projects, not divisive. And I think knowledge is power. And so understanding as much as we can about uh, this process is, increasing our knowledge and increasing our power as informed citizens. Trying to help form a more perfect union. It's kind of like doctors practicing medicine. We're trying to practice a more perfect union. And uh, over the 233 years, we've been practicing and practicing and practicing. And we're gonna be practicing some more, but it takes involved citizens to make that work. From Daria to everyone, she's here because of a mini history lesson and to learn more about what we can do to be involved, especially locally. Okay. Well, I hope this did provide some uh, information about the issues that are going on locally and some of the groups that are involved um, in the state. I'm wondering, should we be concerned? What would, we hear people talking about we're facing a possible constitutional crisis as a result of this upcoming election. Would that in any way affect our constitution and, and how would it affect it? I don't know, Kevin, do you have, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, the, the, the only reason that the election would be a constitutional crisis would be if there were uh, disputed claims over who won the election. Um, it, and you know that's that's sort of a hypothetical future scenario. Um, we don't really have good information about that. Uh, what's going to happen uh, on the first week of November? But um, it, it's it's a little bit different than this concept of amending the Constitution, which we're focusing on here today. Um, there may be possible amendments to the Constitution that would uh, provide greater certainty about uh, succession from one presidency to the next. Um, but there aren't any out there that I'm aware of that uh, seek to do that at this time. So uh, the, the amendment process could potentially be used to address those types of issues in the future. But as far as I'm aware, it's not currently being used to address those types of issues. Thank you. Anybody else have a question that they'd like to ask or tell us why they've joined our conversation to this evening? Well, Beverly, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make or Kevin? 
Well, I'd like to say that this was um, uh, a great exercise for me. Uh, it's my passion. Uh, I have to keep it in perspective and remember that all the amendments took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to happen. And so it's not easy. It doesn't happen fast. You have to have a commitment and long-term vision. Um, so is it a mission impossible? No, but it is a difficult hike. <laughs> we'll put it that way. And so I think the more that we can understand about what works and what doesn't, what makes an amendment um, possible and what can uh, bring its demise is something we need to be informed of and aware of. Uh, so I'm hoping that people feel a little more educated about um, the process and not discouraged, um, but um, ready to gird their loins if, uh, if they're willing to join, join the action as a participant citizen. And I appreciate this um, forum very much. Thank you so much. Anyone else have any last minute comments they'd like to make? Well, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, if there are people on this, uh, participating in this event that would like to get more involved at the local level, they're certainly uh, welcomed to uh, contact uh, Beverly at the uh, email address she provided earlier in this uh, uh, presentation. And um, we'd be happy to uh, bring you into our a uh, little family of uh, activists and, and uh, put you to work. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. We appreciate your being here this evening. Stacia, what do we do now? Or Kari, I should ask, maybe. <laughs> well, in my opinion, what you should do now is Come to the library if you'd like to research this topic more. We have a couple of different things that we can do. We have our personal librarian service. So if you would, um, if you would like to fill out a form, um, the library can find, get some personalized resources for you, whether it's campaign finance, the electoral process in, in uh, just the electoral process, or anything else that you're interested in learning about. We also have one for recreational reads if you just need something new. So that's what you can do next from the library. I'll let Kari take the other. Sorry, I was just trying to put a link in the, in the chat box for you guys. Um, I would just like to thank everyone for coming. Uh oh, I haven't had my video on. It's very dark all of a sudden. Um, and um, really hope that you're able to join us at upcoming events. And I've got a link in the chat bar so that you can find them. Um, this group of, of, of um, organizations is working on an event on dark money on October 22nd. And then um, Alaska Common Ground is hosting a couple of events discussing ballot measure one and two in October. So there's information on all of that in the link I put in the chat bar. And I really, Beverly, thank you. That was awesome. You put in a lot of time and effort into getting that ready to go. And um, that was so interesting. And I really appreciate Alaska Common Ground being invited to be part of this. So thank you. Yes, I enjoyed it. And I also want to share that this um, presentation has been recorded. I'm not sure how people access it. Maybe Stacia can. Oh, uh, I'll I'll have a link that will be available, and so um, I'll be sending that to all of you, and Station can, can maybe uh, post it somewhere, but we'll discuss that. Um, but we'll, we'll let people know on our various websites how they can access that. Yeah, it's just I see a lot of people have come on later in the presentation, and they may want to um, be able to start it from the beginning. <laughs> well, are we ready to shut it down? Sorry. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, all you for everybody. Mm -hmm. Good night. Bye.